subscribe. Hello, fight fans, and welcome to the one, the unofficial podcast of the One Fighting Championship. Thank you very much for joining me on today's episode. We will be covering one Friday Night Fights 18, Tyson Harrison of Australia versus Pong Sari. Now, you might have heard that there weren't any fights going on this weekend, and that's just simply not true. Of course, we had one Friday Night Fights. We also had UFC Road to UFC, which I'll be going over in a separate episode that's going to come out in a couple of days. But I've got coverage on both of them. Both of them were a great night of fights, two two nights of fights in the, in the uh, case of the Road to UFC with some amazing finishes and some great action and uh, if you missed it, you're gonna wanna you're gonna wanna go back and and watch it because it was just a, a couple of great nights of fighting. So that's my recommendation to you. Now here's here's what I need. You know, I had to get UFC Fight Pass to watch Road to Road to UFC. You know, eighty five bucks for the year. You know, I don't know what else I'm gonna watch on there. Like. Grappling tournaments with Anthony Smith and them, maybe. Who knows? We'll see. But that's an expense for the show. You know, that's I do that for you, you know, so you could get this awesome content. You know, I've got a uh, podcast hosting site that's 40 bucks a month. I've got a video hosting site that's 20 bucks a month. I gladly spend all this money out of pocket. Gladly do it. Gladly do it. And all I ask in return is that you take that greasy little paw, you put it on the mouse, you scroll over to that subscribe button, you click it, you go over to that like button, you give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down. I'm more than happy with that. If you give me a thumbs down and you tell me this is the worst garbage you've ever seen, that helps me a lot too. So either one. And then ring that bell. And when you're around all of your friends at the local watering hole or the lo local Buffalo Wild Wings, tell them, hey, the one is the greatest podcast I've ever seen. The host is damn sexy. He's hilarious. And he gives excellent, excellent, excellent critical insights into the fight game. That's all I ask. That's all I ask. And then someday, because of that, I'll be able to become a rich podcaster. I'll be worth millions and millions, possibly billions. Who knows? Who knows what the future can hold? And it'll be great because women will lust after me like they do for Ariel Helwani. And men across the world will respect me just like they do Brendan Shaw. And that's all I want in this world. And millions of dollars. So if you could, like, subscribe, help me get those numbers up. Let's grow this thing together, people. You know I love you. You love me. Let's make it happen. All right, enough talk. Let's get down to business. Our cider of the episode is not a cider at all because I got news for you. Your boy's on keto. You can, you can only see the top half. I know the top half looks great, but if you could see down like another six or eight inches, it's a train wreck. So we're getting on that keto. We're going we're gonna to crush out this keto. I'm trying to drop, you know, going to Greece in, in like two months. So I want to drop a couple pounds. So I'll be probably doing seltzers for a while. This is Arizona Ranch Water. Agave Hard Seltzer by Huss Brewing Company. And it's Arizona Tangerine, 95 calories, 100% real lime juice. And for those of you who don't know about ranch water, it's kind of like seltzer, except it's got like a salty taste, almost like a Corona. That's pretty good. I like it. I like it way better than most seltzers. Most seltzers have that like chemical taste that I'm not a big fan of. All right, enough of that. You've already, that's given you plenty of time to go and like and subscribe. Thank you again for doing that. Appreciate it. Let's get into these fights. And again, I just want to reiterate, this is going to be an abbreviated show because of the holiday. I got stuff going on this weekend. We're going to go over the fights here. We're going to do some news. And then in the next couple of days, I'm going to go over that excellent Road to UFC event that took place over the same weekend. Probably if you're checking out, if you're not checking out my shorts, definitely check out my shorts because I'm going to put some some clips on there i'm on i'm on um tiktok i'm on instagram the underscore one underscore podcast i think that's it i'll put it in the notes my brain's fried from doing drugs don't ask me to remember this stuff okay let's get to it fight fans 
Okay, so we had one Friday night fight to 18. And one is really getting this thing down to a fine art. They're getting it down to a science, you know. This is one's, not their first TV deal, but this is a big TV deal, you know. This takes place from Lupini Stadium every every week. And, you know, to my knowledge, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, I know you will in the comments, one is the only other MMA organization besides the UFC that's putting out this frequency of shows. I don't think anybody's coming close. I think most organizations are happy to get one out a month, and some don't do that. So to have weekly shows, and the only time they don't have these weekly uh, Friday night fights is when they're putting on a big Saturday show and puts them in a different league. It just goes to show you, UFC is the biggest on the Western Hemisphere, and one is the biggest on the Eastern Hemisphere. So let's get into it. I'll have to say right off the bat, numbers wise, this didn't deliver the the amount of uh, finishes that the last two episodes have had. You know, the last two episodes, I think we got something like a, a, a 70 plus percent finish rate. There's a couple of decisions here. And because of that, I'm going to skip over one or two fights. But just because there was decisions, just like in any MMA organization, doesn't mean they weren't good fights. There was a ton of good fights on here, and there was uh, one or two that you definitely won't want to miss. So I'll highlight those ones if you're just trying to go back and, you know, check out highlights. I'll steer you in the right direction on that. So opening up the fight, as usual, we have MMA. And you all know I love MMA in the ring. I really, it's, this show has been a revelation to me. That, you know, all or MMA organizations should be doing fights in the ring. You know, it prevents stalling. It prevents guys from pushing people up against the side of the cage. And I know I know what the what the uh, argument against that is going to be is that guys get tripped up in the ropes. Well, watch watch one Friday night fights that rarely happens. And when it does happen, guys are able to to work their way through it. it there's a very rarely. In these one FC Friday night fight MMA fights are guys caught up in the ropes where they have to stop the fight and reposition them. It's not like the old pride days. The pride, the pride ring was different. It was like a boxing ring. And if you look at one's ring, they have a rope that goes along the bottom and then all the ropes are reinforced going up several places in the rope. So it is like a solid structure, just not a structure that's solid enough to push somebody up against for 15 minutes. So that's that's the reason why I think, you know, it's it's different and it works so well. And there's so many advantages. You could see better. You know, the 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 judges could see better. I I don't know if any of you have ever been ringside at a UFC event. I've certainly never been ringside, but I've been I've been pretty close before, and uh, it's hard to see. You know, the 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 uprights are in your way. The camera guys in your way. Most of the time when you're looking at the ground game, you're, you're watching on the monitor. So this is a really cool way to watch fights. I know that, that the cage is the thing right now, but I hope in the future we see more MMA organizations that use a ring similar to, um, to the one that one is using on Friday Night Fights. So we kicked off the night with Ali Kubdula against Richard Godoy. And Godoy hurt Kubdula in the first round and dropped him with a calf kick, which makes me wonder, you know, this is an MMA fight that's happening in Lumpini Stadium. Most of the fights that are going to be going on are Muay Thai. Is there like, is there like Muay Thai fighters who are in the back warming up and they're watching these MMA fights and they're looking at Godoy landing these, these crushing calf kicks and, and seeing the effect they have. And, and do you think any of them are like, hmm, maybe I should throw some of those? Because you don't see it in Muay Thai. They don't throw to the calf. I wonder how long it will be before you start seeing that more in Muay Thai. E e anyways, in the second round, uh, Kabdula hurt Godoy with a hook. And he rushed in and attacked with a flying knee. But Godoy caught him with the right hook. And near that nearly finished the fight right there. Godoy almost got the finish. So the 34-year-old Godoy did seem to fade at the end of the second round. I got to say, Godoy either has iron in his chin or Kubula has pillows in his fist. Because Kubula absolutely laid it on Godoy for half of the, the first half of the third round. Um, he did eventually drop him and force the referee to step in and stop the fight. So got a pretty good start to the night. Uh, third round finish and 
you know, we'll have to see we'll have to see what Kudala could do in the uh in the one uh ring. We did get an absolute treat of a fight on this card. And, you know, every once in a while, as an MMA fan, you see a fight and you feel privileged because you know that this fighter is going to go on to do amazing things. And, uh, you know, in, in a short amount of time, this fighter is going to be fighting on, you know, pay-per-views or, or main cards and the days of, of that fighter being on the undercard, it, it really, <clears throat> it's limited. And we get to see, say we were part of that. And that's how I felt watching Johan Guzali versus Ty. You know, Ty is a road to one Thailand finalist and Johan, Johan is a 16 year old. They wouldn't be a big fan of that in the U in the U S a, a 16 year old fighting a guy in his twenties, but Luckily, we're in Thailand and not in the U.S. Yeah, 16 year, years old. Raul Rosa ain't got nothing on Johan Guzali. And, uh, you know, Guzali's from a fighting family. His brothers are all fighters. His parents are fighters. And um, he he's special. He He's he's bringing something to the fight game that we're, we're all going to be looked back on and really appreciate being there when 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 we when he first came out on the scene which is now so you know as far as the fight johan comes out like a house on fire and uh jojo's coming off a 16 second knockout at his last friday night fight and you see why he's super aggressive and he keeps calling ty in he's revving up the crowd crowd you know ty slipped several times like slipped and fell to the ground but i actually think one or two of those he was actually he was actually dropped and he just benefited from the referee giving him the benefit of the doubt. And then in round two, Jojo keeps up his fan friendly ways. He's got like a berserker style. That's the only way I can describe it, but that did create a lot of openings for Ty uh, to land a lot of elbows um, and a step in elbow, you know, landed on, on Jojo and cut him open pretty good. And he can, Jojo continued to attack, but that was a much better round for Ty. Then the doctor stopped the round to check on JoJo, and he allowed the fight to continue. Thank God. I'm not even religious, but thank God. And then round three opens up with back and forth action with Ty continuing to land, and JoJo continued to rev up the crowd, and Ty responded by, like, sticking his tongue out, and 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 the crowd at this point was going crazy. And it seemed like these two fighters who had given so much of themselves in this contest were going to go to a judge's decision. But Johan Guzali had alternate plans. He landed a left hook, right straight combo, that flatline tie, and put a bow on an overwhelmingly exciting fight. This fight literally had me jumping out of my seat. I was watching this at like one in the morning, and I jumped out of my seat and yelled. Probably woke my partner up, but who cares? And uh, and that's a rare thing for me. That's how excited I was by this by this by this fight. And what I'm about to say now is not hyperbole. This is what I honestly, honestly believe. Jojo is the Conor McGregor of Muay Thai. He's the Conor McGregor of Muay Thai. Tell me the, the electricity this young man brings to the 1FC ring does not remind you of Conor McGregor making his featherweight run. And I will question your san sanity or your memory. We're privileged to be able to witness his greatness at such a young age. What's next for this guy? I have a feeling that Johan Guzali is going to go on to be a superstar in one. And he's got all the makings of a superstar. I just hope they manage this, this guy right because he is, he is so young, but so talented. I think I'm going to do a short video series on Johan Guzali and see if I can reach out for an interview before he gets too famous. How cool would that be? So Keep an eye out for that on my YouTube channel. We'll see what we could get done with that. You know, Johan Guzali is my new favorite fighter. He got the 350,000 bot bonus. And in my opinion, he should have got uh, a million bot from Chachri for that performance because that was definitely my fight of the night. And I can't wait to see what's next for this guy. So we had one women's flyweight Muay Thai world champion, 18-year-old Sumila Sundell versus Milena Bello Grelich in a kickboxing match. Or as I like to call it, less exciting Muay Thai. So no elbows, no clinch. 
So why are we doing this? Uh, Sundell wants to be a two discipline champion, like her training partner and my future girlfriend, Stamp Fairtex, who will coincidentally, Stamp Fairtex, I'm talking about, be a three division champion in the near future, I believe. You know, Bella Grelich, as she's coming out to the ring, she looks like she's made of steel. And uh, Sundell looks like a, a high school student. But Sundell's got skills, despite what she looks like. And there was a high ver volume first round with Sundell getting the best of the interactions, you know. In round two, the knees to the body really slowed down Bella Grelich. And in round three, Sundell continued to lay down the body work. You know, I think it was a miracle Bella Grelich made it, made it to the bell. It's a testament to her tenacity and probably her shape, you know. So that's a unanimous decision for Sundell. And Sundell's going to be a major problem in the women's flyweight kickboxing division. Um, she's got a couple things she's got to work on. But yeah, she's going to, she's going to, there's a lot of winnable fights for her in that division. Next, we had Chana John versus Victor Hugo of Brazil. I know I always comment on how cool the Y crew is. And it's only because I'm an ignorant imperialist, you know. But I got to say, the Ramoy that the Thais perform is always way cooler than the ones that the foreigners perform. Uh, so I'll just put that out there. And what about Chana John, huh? He's like, he's like an F boy with 150 fights. You know, he should be on the Thai version of Love Island, in my opinion. Just a good looking man all around. So round one of this fight was really too close to call, but I'll give my unofficial scorecard to Chana Von because he's so damn handsome. And then um, it's a it was a very even fight. We got another decision. This is a rare thing to get two decisions in a row on one Friday night fights, as as uh, as my uh, educated and unemployed fan base knows very well. But they they gave the unanimous decision to the Thai F boy, Chana John. As all the people in the crowd who are attracted to men go crazy, ah, Chana John, you're so hot. All right, and then we got our featured prelim, Mohamed Butasa versus Mohamed Siasarani. And that's right, folks, it's a battle of the Mohammeds. Hey, I mean, it's the most common name in the world. Morocco facing Iran in kickboxing action. So it's just like one Muay Thai, the most exciting sport in the world, except we use bigger gloves and we don't allow elbows or clinching. Fun. Also, at this point, I'm going to take the, the opportunity. I, I don't think I've ever gone over this on the show to explain the weight classes that are in one. Because this reminds me that that uh, it's a little bit different in one than it is in other organizations. So this will be especially useful for North American fans who are new to one. So you'll notice in, in this fight, for example, this is a featherweight kickboxing bout, which would be 145 pounds in North American MMA. But the fighters in this bout weighed in at 155 pounds, which would be lightweight in North American MMA. And this is because one does not allow weight cutting. So the name of the weight class the fighters are fighting at is what they would be fighting at if they were cutting weight. It's meant, I think, to give parity and a point of comparison to North American MMA fighters and to make it easier for North American fans to understand what they're seeing. But I think it actually makes it a lot more confusing. When you're seeing this is a featherweight fight and the guys both weigh in at 155 pounds. So not the most, not the easiest thing to understand, but that's, that's why they do it that way. Anyway, back to this fight. I just want to say that if Chanabon is a Thai F boy, then we got a battle of F boys right here. I mean, these are some sexy Muhammad's right here. Uh, Sir Sirani looks to have the cleaner striking and seems to be the superior counter striker, uh, which is on display because he dropped Buto uh, Butasa with a straight right off the caught kick. And uh, Butasa took the full eight count and came back hyper aggressive to try to get that one back. But it only seemed to open him up for more strikes from Sir Sirani and Sir Sirani feeling firmly in the driver's seat in round two, even dropping his hands and allowing Butasa to land several free shots with seemingly... Very little effect on Sir Sirani. So Sir Sirani came out in the third, ultra confident, and that confidence opened him up to some knees and kicks from Butasa. Now, we have all heard the term take one to one or two to give one, but what Sir Sirani was doing in the third round was not what they meant by that. <laughs> you know, still, these fighters both had the warrior spirit, and that was, and that was uh, you know, on display in this ultra exciting fight. And Sir Sirani knocked down or caused the slip by a push kick, I should say. And instead of climbing up to his feet, he did a kip up 
you know, like a handspring. Get up. It's pretty cool. Pretty neat and exciting. I should also say, I thought Butasa probably won this round due in part to all of the sh shenanigans from Sierra Sarani. Um, but that didn't matter in the end because the right guy got the decision. We had another decision here. And it was super, super, super thrilling fight. And uh, Sierra Sarani takes the decision and fight of the night contender. And this is a huge win for him from an established fighter with a ton of big name experience. And honestly, I can't wait to see more of both of these guys, but especially Sierra Sarani. So I'm assuming he gets the bonus. We didn't get an interview, and I'm guessing that's because we've had so many decisions so far and we're running long. But I'm going to assume he got the, the – even though it was a decision, I'm assuming he got the bonus for that. Maybe someone can tell me in the comments. So that was the preliminary um, featured fight. And opening up the main card, we had – Petnamcom versus Pekrit Sada. And there was super a super short feeling out process on this one. I mean, you can't really even say there was a feeling out process on this one. And Pekrit Sada made a critical mistake. He allowed Petnamcom to corral him into the corner of the ring and stand in that striking range. And it's like Petkrit Sada was basically begging Petnamcom to knock him out. And Petnamcom obliged, you know, 46, 46 seconds into the round. He landed a devastating left hook to the body, followed up by a right straight that sent Pat Kritsada to uh, night-night time, you know? And devastating does not even begin to describe it. Pat Noncom hit Pat Kritsada so hard, he was completely out on his feet, stiff as a board. Uh, Pat Kritsada was lucky that referee Bond was on it and came in and saved him before he could fall to the ground or out of the ropes. I mean, this was amazing work by Pat Noncom, and that's going to be my KO of the night. Easy. Easy KO of the night. What a start, what a finish. That's all I got to say about that. Moving right along, we got Chetanan versus Supa, uh, Super Chilek. And Chetanan seemed to outwork Super Chilek in the first round. But it was a close round overall. Super Chilek dropped Chet, uh, Chetanan in the, uh, at the start of the second. And it was hard to tell what he was hit with, but I rewatched it. I believe it was an inside elbow. Uh, and was therefore a good call by the referee. They weren't sure at first if if he, that was a slip or a drop, but the referee made the right call. That was uh, Chris uh, Alba, Albatador. And, uh, you know, they they could have benefited from instant replay on that, but you didn't need instant replay to see the hook that Chadanon dropped Super Chilek with. Super Chilek responded to the eight count, but he was clearly not recovered. And the next punch that landed was, it was just a left hook to the body, dropped Super Chilek, and, and Gratefully, the ref stepped in to save Super Chilek. Clearly, 350,000 bot bonus, but of course. Now, speaking of ref referee Chris Albatador, now, he's clearly British. You can tell by the accent. And he does a lot of fights with Thai fighters. And at the start of the fight, he has this little thing he does. He goes, brings him in, and he goes, protect yourself at all time. Listen to my instructions at all time. This is like typing on a phone. I don't know how that's listen to my instructions. We want a good, clean fight. I don't know which one that is. Touch gloves. Okay, so that's cool that he's pantomiming. I appreciate that. But there was twice in this fight where the guys had a standing eight count, and he tells them, gloves up. Well, I don't, pretty sure Super Chilek. And Chatanon do not speak English. They don't know what gloves up mean. And so I'm just wondering, would it kill this guy to learn like a few phrases in, in, in Thai? I'm assuming he lives in Thai, or at the very least, he's at every single one of these fights, which so is at least spending a couple of days. Maybe you could go over to referee Bon and say, hey, Bon, how about you teach me a couple of phrases in Thai so I don't have to do sign language with these fighters and they know what I'm saying. I mean, I think this, this would cover it. Protect yourself. Listen to my commands. Good, clean fight. Touch gloves. Stop go. And most importantly, hands up. That's like just a few phrases. I mean, Jason Herzog, Herzog speaks Spanish and Portuguese. Like he doesn't speak the language, but he knows all the words that you would need to know in a fight in Spanish and Portuguese. So just my little thing. I'm not a referee. I don't know how hard that job is, but it seems like that wouldn't be that hard to learn a couple of phrases in Thai since it seems like you're going to be interacting with a lot of Thai fighters in the future. But hey, that's just me. Maybe I'm crazy, you know? You know, so you want to hear about something else crazy? 
um, something else that's crazy was the fight between Sansuri and Red. So both of these guys are 32 years old, which is like 85 in Muay Thai. And Rid is three and one against Sansuri. And um, but that was like 10 years ago. That was in Big Gloves. Sansuri is the twin brother of the headliner Pongsuri. We had brothers fighting last week on one Friday night fight 17 when Rachan getting a victory on the other undercard. And so the brother Opiwat dropping a close decision on the co-main event. So we can see what kind of impact, if any, the outcome of that fight may have had on Pong Suri in the main event. Also, can you imagine getting beat up by identical twins? Like if you got in a bar fight and one, with one of them and then the twin jumped in, it would be surreal. I'd be so upset. You could tell Sansari wants to get back that loss, those losses from Red. He got super aggressive at the end of the round. He seemed to empty the tank with all these five or six punch combinations. And in the start of round two, Sansari used the same game plan. Uh, but this time, Ritt was ready. He waded through those five-punch combo, and he landed an overhand right straight from hell. Straight from hell. He hit Sansuri so hard, Sansuri's twin brother, Pongsuri, in back in the locker room, getting warmed up, felt it. Pongsuri was getting warmed up, and he felt it, because that's how twins work. That's how hard Ritt hit him. Some guys just got your number. Ritz got four of four over Sansuri. Great, great knockout. And it's like uh, I said at the start of the, the card, you know, we got more decisions than usual. But this is still a really amazing card. Really exciting stuff. Next was Ty versus Soklek. And Ty, similar to the previous fight, Ty is 2-0 against Soklek. Soklek is 112. I'll repeat that for you. He, he's had 100 victories and 12 losses. That's not a typo. Also, he's only 20 years old. That's how good Ty is. That two of his losses, two of the 12 losses are to Soklek. And he's only 20 years old. When I was 20 years old, I got drunk and, and took my mom's car and, and crashed it into a McDonald's. And when the person at the McDonald's, I was trying to go through the drive through and I hit the gas and I went right through a plate glass window. And when the people who worked at the McDonald's came up to check on me to see if I was okay, I was so drunk, I thought I was still ordering food. I was like, yeah, can I get a cheeseburger, fries, some of that ranch, and the biggest Dr. Pepper you got? It wasn't good. That's what I was doing in my 20s. Sock Leck is winning 100 fights in Muay Thai with only 12 losses. So he's a better man than I am. And Ty has a ton of swagger. Ty dropped Soklek with a short jab early in the first round. And Ty actually battered Soklek with elbows and leg kicks. It was a burner of a first round. It was awesome. If you haven't watched that, go back and watch it. It was a great round. Round two, Ty continues to batter Soklek. And it was starting to look like the beginning of the end. But out of nowhere, Soklek lands a thunderous right cross to the body and drops Ty. It really didn't matter, though, because seconds later, Ty lands a jump knee that separates Soklek from the conscious realm. Out of nowhere. How's this for a statistic? Sorry, that was probably loud. I'm getting excited. <laughs> How's this for a statistic? Soklek is now 113. So he has 100 wins and 13 losses. And nearly one-fourth of his losses, a full 23%, are from one man, from Ty. So Ty wanted, he asked for one bonus from Chatri to send his, to help send his brother and sister to university. And Chatri did him one better. He gave him two bonuses, 700,000 baht. Man, that seems pretty cheap. I mean, maybe I should have gone to college in Thailand. I would love to only have $10,000 in student loan debt. But uh, regardless, it's not about me or my crippling student loan debt that keeps me up all night. Uh, it's about it's about Ty. He's a special fighter. I want to see more of him. And great for that's a great story with his with his uh, siblings that are going to college. Hopefully, he's not secretly like a uh, drug addict and he's just going to spend all that money on drugs. I don't think he is. He's in excellent shape. Although some of those guys on meth are in excellent shape too. All right. Continuing down the line, Samingdan versus Maha, Maha Mongkol. And, you know, Samingdan coming out in the Black Panther mask, representing Wakanda, a little weird. At least it wasn't a white guy, but still kind of weird. 
it sounds like Summing Dad's doing some cool stuff with his gym where he trains less fortunate kids and fighters who have like lost their way, whatever that means. It's cool. Uh, I guess he used his last bonus for to to help build the gym. So that is kind of cool. You know, in Samingda lands a meaningful head kick that Maham uh, Mongkul partially blocks, but it still wobbles him. And Samingda is a house on fire. He 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 seems to have a significant striking advantage. And Samingda slowed down considerably in round two and seemed to favor the clinch. Um, definitely shifted away from his aggressive style of the first round. Uh, Maham Mongkul took advantage of that and may have stole the round just based on the limited output. There wasn't a lot going on. There was a lot of clinching. Kind of concerning to see. And Simon Dam, you know, kind of self-sabotaged himself in the third. He dominated the round, but because he didn't spent the entire fight in a clinch, he he precluded himself from that 350000 bot bonus. He could have got the unanimous decision. But it was obvious that Simon Dam has the ability to finish uh, Mahang Mankal and didn't. So, you know, I guess that's good that you got the victory, but that's not what they do in 1FC, you know, so... He'll probably have to reassess and come out with a different game plan next time he fights, of course. So now we have our main event, Tyson Harrison of Australia versus Pong Sari. And uh, Tyson Harrison, he's a cool dude. He's got like a great look to him. He does this, uh, his Noi John, John Wayne, because I guess he looks similar to John Wayne Parr and he comes out with the hat and the pistols and stuff. And that's cool. You know, you definitely want to market yourself. I think there's a lot of excitement to having a, uh, a, uh, a foreigner fight a tie in the main event. And Pong Tari weighed in at 148. He was about five pounds heavier than Harrison. And despite that fact, Harrison looked like the much bigger fighter in the ring. Harrison's a big dude. However, Harrison didn't really fight like the bigger, longer fighter. And just sort of sat in the pocket and struck with Pong Sari. You know, Harrison had youth and strength on his side and uh, used that to get an early lead in the first round. However, Pong Sari had experience and an iron will to win on his side. And he started to come back from that at the end of the first. The second round continued that momentum shift for Pong Sari. He seemed to be getting better, the better of the second striking exchanges and the beginning of the third round saw Harrison start to fade as Pong Shuri poured on the pressure. And this is not what you want to see in a fighter that is 10 years younger in Harrison than his opponent. I think Tyson Harrison needs to go back to his gym and work on his endurance and his physical training. It was a great fight overall that went to the judge's decision with all three judges giving them the unanimous decision to Pong Shuri. He also got a 350,000 bot bonus for this fight. Um, it was a great fight overall to cap off a, a, another exciting night of fights. And then uh, we found out Tyson Harrison got the bonus as well. I don't know if I agree with that. I mean, good for him. I'm not trying to take away from that. It was a great fight, but Pong Sari was clearly the better fighter. If I was Pong Sari, I would have felt like, hey, if you're going to give him a bonus, you should give me two bonuses because I beat him. So in this fight, we had six decisions and five KOs, extremely unusual for one Friday night fights, just a 45% finish rate. But still, I think it was an exciting night of fights. We saw some great KOs and a lot of those decisions were really exciting. Like the main event was a decision, but it was quite exciting. So we've got some more great fights. Again, every weekend we're doing fights with one. With one. I'll be covering that in the next episode. Again, this is kind of a special special uh abbreviated episode because of the holiday and because i'm doing some traveling i'm actually going up to uh for those who don't know i'm in arizona and i'll be going up to flagstaff for those of you who don't know let's get a little personal here for those of you who don't know uh, i used to be a motorcycle mechanic for years and i worked uh investment dealerships all over the country and um this weekend there's a Vespa rally that's going on in, in, in Flagstaff, Arizona. And I actually live in Phoenix, Arizona. So I'm going to be going up to Flagstaff for a couple of days to hang out with the scooter nerds and have a good time and drink and not think about podcasting. So we're going to do an abbreviated episode today. This is all, all you get today is the uh, coverage of the, of the one fight. I'm going to go over a little news and then Early next week, either over the weekend or early next week, I'm going to be covering the UFC road to Shanghai. So 
I watched all of Road to Shanghai. When I agreed to, to cover Road to Shanghai for you, my loving, unappreciative fans, I didn't realize it was eight hours of fighting. But hey, I'm not complaining. I mean, I am, but whatever. You should just know that. Like, subscribe, ring the bell, tell your loser friends. But I got that. I got my notes. I got it covered. I'm going to make a video for that. Put it out there for you. Make sure you spread the word. And in the meantime, if you haven't watched UFC Road to Road to UFC Shanghai, do yourself a favor and watch it because it was killer. It was a great, great night of fights. I highly recommend it. And that way you could be all caught up and I'm not I'm not having to give you this news firsthand. All right, let's get it. Speaking of news, let's get into some news here. So this came across my desk, so to speak. UFC Hall of Famer BJ Penn makes outlandish claim about CTE. BJ Penn making an outlandish claim? I'm intrigued. Let's read on. The prodigy sparked a bit of controversy about a topic that's long been associated with the sport, chronic traumatic encephalopathy or CTE. Uh, someone someone uh, was trolling BJ out there. BJ must have said something about COVID or something. And uh, someone said CTE kicking in hard lately. And uh, BJ Penn replied, what is CTE again? Did Ali have that? What about Jim Brown? Did he have that? CTE is as fake as the coronavirus. Oh, I, I just have to say, I just have to say, I completely agree with this. I mean, sure. Did BJ Penn have coronavirus twice? Yes, he did. But it is fake. I mean... At least that's what BJ Penn says, you know, and I trust BJ Penn. BJ Penn was one of the best fighters ever. He was the first North American to ever win worlds in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. He got his Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt in three years. So we can take medical advice from BJ Penn. We can take it from BJ Penn. We can trust him. He's trustworthy, folks. And this is definitely... Satire. So don't take this video down because I'm talking about coronavirus. This is satire and not to be construed as medical advice. But BJ Penn knows what he's talking about. BJ Penn ran for governor of Hawaii and he got 15,000 votes out of a, a state with 8,500 or 85,000 registered voters. That's a lot. That's like almost 1%. Okay, BJ Penn is trustworthy. And if BJ says coronavirus is fake, even though he got it twice, and CTE is fake, even though he clearly has it, then it's fake. That's all you need to know. Okay, I don't know why that people are making such a big deal out of this. BJ Penn is just taking facts and relaying it to you. BJ Penn almost became the governor of Hawaii. I mean, did he run for governor on the Republican ticket in a state that hasn't elected a Republican governor in the last 25 years? Yes. But if BJ Penn would have won the, the, the preliminary uh, election, he would have definitely been elected governor. And then he could have made the changes he wanted. For example, for example, he could have taken care of coronavirus the way he wanted to. According to BJ Penn, he said, we will get rid of all vaccine passports. Hawaii will be a vaccinated with aloha and unvaccinated with aloha policy for everyone. If only our leaders in Washington, D.C. could have these clear, non-confusing, straightforward views on policy, we'd be so much better. Thank you, Governor B.J. Penn. Now, was BJ Penn on a seven fight losing streak prior to being released from the UFC after a video of a bar fight showed him getting knocked unconscious by some guy in the bar? Yes. But that just shows you BJ Penn is willing to fight for what he believes in. And I'm sure whatever started that fight with that guy, that guy probably said that you couldn't cure COVID with oregano oil. And that's probably what started that fight. And BJ Penn, you know, he's quoted as saying, when I got COVID those two times, even though it's fake, 
BJ Penn said, when I got COVID those two times, even though it's fake, I used oregano oil and that worked for me. And this guy in this bar probably said, that's wrong. I think you should use a vaccination and, and, and try to be healthy and avoid contact with coronavirus. And BJ Penn probably got so mad at that fake news that he just had to get in a fight with this guy. And did that guy knock him unconscious in the in the front of a bar in Hawaii? Yes. But, but BJ Penn's going to fight for what he believes in. Now, was BJ Penn issued a restraining order after the mother of his children accused him of years of physical and sexual abuse? And was he investigated on suspicion of DUI that same year or a year later following a single car motor vehicle crash and and subsequent blood alcohol tests in his hometown of Hilo? Of Hilo? And that, the year after that, was Penn caught on video being placed in handcuffs by police on suspicion of DUI following a reckless driving complaint? Yes. Yes, he was. But I got news for you people. That's not from CTE. Why? Because CTE is not real. How do I know? Because BJ Penn told me so. And BJ Penn used to be a really good fighter. All right, that's it for this, this episode, folks. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you enjoyed that last little bit about BJ Penn. You know what I'm going to ask, you know. I, I, I know I talk negative about the fans. You know, I know I say that they're unemployed, that they live in their mom's basement, that their hands are covered in grease from McDonald's French fries, that they haven't finished the eighth grade, that they're, they're constantly getting hit up by their ex-wives for, for child support, which they don't have because they bought, uh, spent $1,000 on, on UFC name on Canvas. I know I, I'm saying generally that they spend all their time, instead of promoting my podcast, just adding dumbass comments to the comment section. But despite all that, I want you to know that I love y'all. And uh, you're just the greatest fans a guy could have. And all I want in response for that is, is a like, a subscribe. And, you know, maybe tell your friends, you know, I mean, I, I know like uh, like uh, your friends don't have money that they could send me, but they could send me a like and a subscribe and that's free for them. So it's great. It'll work out great for everybody. So go ahead, like, subscribe, share, tell all your friends and let's grow this podcast together. Let's show them what independent MMA podcasting is all about. And then you could say, hey, I was there early when the one, the unofficial podcast of the ultimate of the one fighting championship <laughs> I guess I should get that down. The one, the unofficial podcast of the One Fighting Championship first took off and became the most successful podcast in America. Until next time, I'll catch y'all on the flip side.